that's the way my stand looks like under the micrograph of the thermal image. So mushrooms create heat, carbon dioxide, and water. Heat, carbon dioxide, and water. They sweat. They can take humidity out of the air, absorb it, and then sweat it right in front of them into their environment. So they're swimming through their own sweat. Actually, they're swimming through their own urine. Is it too early for that? <laughs> I mean, it's easy eating one. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> right. So they're sweating these chemical keys. Uh, they need that moisture to produce the, the enzymes that are capable of breaking down their food, their substrate, whether it's straw, logs, chips, leaves, it doesn't matter. All right. Um, so these baby mushrooms uh, can form from that biomass within a couple weeks. So how do you build fungal biomass? That's really, really what we're doing here, is just um, like making bread culture, separating. That's it. You need to build biomass from a very small sample that you gather in the wild. Right. And uh, it's, it's as simple as finding an oyster mushroom, um, and we can do this on our scavenger hunt. When we do this, do some little cardboard burritos, and y'all can take, y'all can clone an oyster mushroom and take it home on cardboard. Time. It's easy. I do that technique all the time. Even though I have a big fancy lab now, I'll be on vacation somewhere and I'll find something. I don't have pastry plates with me. I don't have a laminar flow hood. But I really want this mushroom, so I'll just find some uh, cardboard, dip it in water, cut the base of the mushroom up, wrap it up, and, and stick it in a little bag. And by the time I get home a week later, it's colonized the cup of cardboard. And I can expand that. Or I can take that and transfer it back to the pastry plate and purify it. So it's a way for me to uh, kind of cheat a little bit. So how do we do this? All right. The easiest way is to use um, recyclable materials. All right. And um, you can see coffee grounds, shavings, whatever. It's already been, coffee grounds has already been pasteurized by the machines. We've been around town uh, with our scavenger hunt. Today, I think it's at 2 to 3 o'clock. Um, we're going to encourage everybody to meet over there and just go around and ask area businesses, what do you have? Uh, what do you have that mushrooms can eat? And uh, you'll be surprised. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the different plant material, dry plant material, coffee grounds, paper boxes, shredding some clothes. So this is what we're going to do today at 2 o'clock, is dumpster diving. <laughs> right? We're going to go out and do it. And this is what we did in Haiti because we didn't have wheat straw. We didn't have logs that we could inoculate. All the trees are gone. They're burning, out, burning down the hillside. Have you ever been to Haiti before? Have you ever seen pictures of it? Um, there's hardly anything there. Now, all, the, all the trees are being burned for fuel. All right? But there's a lot of this. A lot of it. And it's everywhere. Uh, in the streets, along the hillsides. It just gets dumped on the hillside like mulch. This is their mulch, basically. Um, so, but there's 30 to 40 percent of household waste that is cardboard or paper or usable for mushroom substrates. 60 to 80 percent of businesses. That's why we want to go around the businesses in this town is to show them that some of the things that they're throwing away we can use to grow mushrooms on. And they're very selective to mushroom mycelium, meaning you don't need a laboratory. All we need to do is soak in a little water, add some cultures to it, and then roll them up, and then we'll keep propagating it. So even if I gave you a very small pellet, or this was the base of an oyster mushroom, does anybody know what an oyster mushroom is? Yeah. Uh, this is a small pellet of spawn. You see the size of it? Um, this can also be the base of an oyster mushroom. It's the very base, the, the part that's too woody to eat, or too fibrous to eat. If you wrap it up in cardboard, it'll, it'll turn right back into mycelium, just like that, just as if it was on a pastry plate. That's it. So you're meaning the, the bottom of this, the, of this type? The very, right where right it yeah. attaches to the wood. Yeah. It, uh, it reverts right back to a vegetative state very quickly, better than any other mushroom. So this small, tiny pellet or base of a mushroom that you find, all right. All you do is, and this is my challenge, but this is for my TED talk, and um, this is called a one grain challenge. But it, for you, uh, it's uh, this one tiny little pellet. Um, all I did was take spent coffee grounds that I found somewhere, all right, 
a little bit, put it in a baggie. Start it off with that one little baggie. It's my battery dog. See? And then you put it inside a little baggie. Within one week, it's colonized that one little baggie. Within the next week, then you divide that baggie up into ten baggies. Right? You get the drip? Because it can't get any harder. And, and do you have the baggies sealed? Yes. Or yeah, they're totally sealed. There's enough air in there for that mycelium. Even though they're aerobic, they, there's enough in there just for them to colonize that much. You don't need a hole. All right. So now I have ten baggies. A query, unless you have a way. Uh, a lot of problems with mold contamination at this stage, especially with coffee grounds. Is there any trick that you have for that? Well, inside the bags, the mycelium is outgassing uh, antifungal compounds, so this is easier to do like this. Um, when you do it in a big bucket or a jar, so there's more seal, then you yeah, you have a better chance. Yeah. You're right. We're so not decreasing the ratio of product experiences in contamination like here in this method that are using less coffee grounds to to your mycelia, yeah. then you have less contamination because there's more antifungal and the bacteria in the bottle. Yeah, it's, it's a quite you, more mycelium you have in there, the more what's going on. Um, so now we have 12 bags, let's say. All right. Then you can graduate, you can break all those up and go for a five gallon bucket. So you start with that. Or a small one gallon, then a three gallon, five gallon bucket. You see that? That's coffee grounds, paper, cardboard. There's a cereal box in there somewhere, period. Right. Now, you can either fruit that mushroom out from that little piece or stem that you've cloned from that mushroom you found right in the wild. Um, this is a uh, collection of coffee grounds, and uh, the lid is actually screwed on. That's a threaded top, and it was inside my lab. You can see my laminar back here, my old lab. Um, it was actually threaded on because I moved it to set it up in my lab, and I forgot about it. And I had the lid on. And I came into the lab one morning, and the lid was on the floor. And I was just like, back in my lab was at my house. I'm like, did the cat get in here or something? I'm like, where is it? And um, so I looked up on the shelf and this is what I saw. This mushroom pushed the lid over the threading right off of the jar. It stripped it off to get out. And that's what it looked like. It was just standing there like, you know. <laughs> so uh, oyster mushrooms can lift about 80 pounds per square inch. So if you don't have a jack in your car, just put one of these jars. Fine. Take a beer. Okay. If you don't want to take your feet, again, what's your question? Well, were you using that technique for rubber coffee grounds? I mean, is there a chance you can put too much moisture in there? You can put some moisture in there, right? But too much can be bad too. Yeah. Just the carbon makes it a little bit moist, and then it puts it. That's it. Yeah. Don't put it in dry. And, and sometimes the, if the coffee's really wet, the cardboard helps wick it out of the coffee. Okay. You can do that as well. Um, so, without, um, once mycelium fruits, well, this is important, if you do decide to fruit these jars, it kind of loses interest, this mycelium, to go backwards and revert back to mycelium at a certain state. Because what happens is it's now, look, you see all the droplets inside this jar? It's producing secondary and tertiary metabolites. Um, they're actually drawing a lot of bacteria, they're cultivating bacteria in there. Because that's its, remember what I said, that's its urine, that's its waste. So it needs bacteria to get rid of that, just like a septic tank. So it cultivates bacteria on purpose. Now you try to expand it after a few weeks of in this state, what else, what else are you going to be expanding? Bacteria. You're going to have some problems, all right? So I would let this colonize and then expand it immediately. It's like the golden egg. Don't eat the golden egg, right? Or the, don't kill the goose. But there's other mushrooms and strains you can use that are very, very fast and rapid, and they're actually very resilient against molds. Have you ever grown pink oyster? Anyone? It's amazing. This is the one. Why, this is why we're using pink oyster in Haiti. It's because it's predatory on different molds. Uh, Aspergillus, even some trichodermis. It will just run right over the top of them and eat them for dinner. Uh, if I have contamination in the lab, I'm not worried about it usually. I'll just let it eat it up. It loves to eat other molds. So these are pink oyster mushrooms going off of a spent 
egg carton, right? That's filled with shredded paper from an office. So once you have your five-gallon bucket, this is your golden egg right here, all right? This, uh, this is your accomplishment. Now you've grown this from one tiny little what? Pellet this big. Imagine that. Something that weighed a couple grams. Do you know how much this bucket weighs now? It weighs about 30 pounds of mycelium. There's 20 to 30,000 miles of mycelium here. And all you need is that little fragment to start another one. Right? So I would, I would opt not to prove this. This is your mother bucket. All right. So then what you do is a rapid exponential um, expansion technique. So you take your first your bucket here, all right, and you expand it times 10, okay? That's, that's a pretty, pretty good ratio. Your best looking one, you want to expand. Once these all turn into a beautiful <coughs> mycelium, then you take your best looking one and you propagate it again. You take your best looking one out of the 10. The nine buckets, you can then use as spawn to inoculate fruiting medium times 10. Nine times 10 is what? 90. 90 buckets is a lot. Because within three weeks after, two to three weeks after you make those buckets, they're fruiting, right? So within, let's say the, uh, once you have this bucket, this is a weekly transfer, one, two, you have 90 buckets, within four weeks after you get that bucket, you have 180 pounds of mushrooms in two, what, four weeks after the bucket, 180. Guess what? The next week you have another 180. And then the flushes start overlapping, meaning first flush, second flush, third flush, at a rate of a half of the previous one. So you not only have 180, half of 180 is 90, and then 45, add all up. And every week you'll be getting uh, hundreds of pounds of mushrooms. It's a lot. Do you see how quickly it can become a, a really good survival tool? Just to have a little bit of spawn in a situation like Haiti or after an earthquake or tsunami when there's nothing around. If you have a little bit of my ceiling or you find a mushroom, you can clone it, expand it, and get it into this state, you are in business. Right? Start a mushroom business after an earthquake. Right? So how do you how do you treat the one culture? So you're taking the nine ones that aren't looking as good as the one best one. So the nine ones you multiply times ten and prove those out. How do you treat the one best? The best one only gets transferred to ten more to make ten more masters. Okay. Yeah. Um, now the recycling uh, the recycling with the mushrooms. All right. This is uh, the different types of things that you can use and the things you should be looking for today at two to three o'clock. Remember, we gotta pretend like we're desperate. I don't have to pretend, right? I'm gonna walk around town um, and look for stuff as if my life depended on it. And a lot of these materials, like spent coffee grounds, uh, go to the coffee shops, cardboard, cereal boxes, shredded. That's what we're gonna be looking for today. And we're gonna bring it all back to the park, and then we're going to spawn it all in these big bins. Right? You can even take some of it home if you want. Once you have that stuff colonizing, see these are my jeans. I should have worn them today. <laughs> that would look really cool at the festival. <laughs> I'll do it next year. <laughs> the whole suit, real mushrooms. Yeah, the, the, these are growing off of my jeans. <clears throat> they got my Then we can eat the mushrooms off. Peck me to death. So, cotton or denim jeans are made out of cotton. I mean, they're just made out of cotton. Yes. Well, you know, I can get to the bucket stage and have these big buckets in my ceiling and they're growing really well. I live in an extremely dry climate and that the, problem, the thing I'm struggling with is that um, the buckets just dry out. And I have a garbage can and I can dunk them in the garbage can full of water because I don't want to waste water. Right. I want to spray That's water right. on them. Yep. And it's a precious resource. So I dunk them in these garbage cans, but they still dry out. They'll dry out after two days. So. At least in my climate, what I struggle with, you know, this is all really nice theoretical stuff. But how do I keep those? How do I keep the moisture or the, you know, enough moisture in the air so that they'll fruit and 
buckets don't dry. Do you keep them moist all the time or try to? I try to. You should, because uh, they should be dry two thirds of the time. Um, mushrooms, there's water up here, y'all. I spotted it. Speaking of water. Um, I, in my pruning rooms, I don't have automated cells in there. Um, I have everything on racks. And uh, we, like our shiitakes, for instance, the folks are awful about saying humidifying the whole room and keeping it humid all the time. Mushrooms can dehydrate up to a year and stay very alive. In fact, they feed better with their uh, metabolites, their enzymes, at a, at a much lower um, water percentage moisture. So as they're charging their battery to fruit again, once that you fruit your mushrooms, you do want to keep them moist that one week. These oyster mushrooms, for instance, um, we let them go completely dry. So if I just let the buckets out for how many weeks would you do them now? So it depends on your fruiting cycle. I would say two weeks. Two weeks and then yeah. just dunk them again. Then, then, you, then you hydrate them and boom, they explode. And I, and I don't need to worry about the humidity to... Not at all. I mean, when they're, as soon as you dunk them again, they're going to trigger them into using that battery charge to fruit. Then you would need, need to maintain the humidity. Um, I would, I would either say put them in an enclosed humidity tent, let them pin, and then you can, then you can in, increase the, uh, the gas exchange and oxygen, right, as they mature, because you don't want them to get long and steady. But once they're pinned, I can just take them out. Yeah, then you can just piss them with water. Okay. Yeah. Um, you had, yeah. I want to add something to that shower cap. Okay. Uh, put it here and kind of push it, uh, you know, like you're operating a month, a month or something. Now in fact get some fresh air and the bucket and everything. But that all holds the community and it's uh well okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Step um, involves a little bit of a treatment. 
question here. Is the centered uh, voltage at the uh, top of the starting mechanism? Not to start it, no, uh, so to, 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 to fruit it. So you have your growing media, okay? Um, this is the system set up for Haiti. Growing media, um, we grow in the mushrooms. I use reusable buckets, uh, nursery buckets, because they, um, they water easy, they drain. They already have holes, they stack nice, they're free. They go to the landfill, save them from the landfill. They're washable. Um, they're black, so in the winter they absorb a little bit of heat. You know, there's some, there's some advantages to them. Uh, what are you using? Nursery pots. Oh, okay. Black nursery pots. All right. So once we fruit the mushrooms, then we can remember. Remember, some of these diets before they fruit, we perpetuate the culture. They produce mushrooms. Then we feed them to the worms. Then we create soil. Soil goes back out to the field. We grow our plants, like squash, for example. We dry that plant waste. Then we have a perpetual circle here. See, it self feeds itself. You got more foliage for the mushrooms again, for your cultures. We designed this system also for urban environments, because I used to live in the Middle East. Um, not a lot of topsoil. In the not a lot of topsoil in downtown Cairo. <laughs> on top of my flat, you look on the roof. Uh, a lot of urban environments in India, uh, Middle East, there's a lot of roofs, there's a lot of space that we can use to grow. If we can make, imagine, if we can get the mushrooms growing in the shady spots, and then you're making soil on top of the roof. Then you plant your plants there. Right. So how do we pasteurize this? Um, without electricity, um, some most people would use propane. But again, without trying to use any uh, inputs, um, you could also use logs. And uh, if, if that's available, I've tried burning the leftover uh, substrates, you know, like my blocks, and it's it's. It's flame retardant, so it didn't work. <laughs> I had that was my master plan, and it didn't work. I threw it on my fire pit, and I was like, yeah, it's just going to go up in flames. It's made of kite and sugar, and it just went, and just, the whole log just sat there. <laughs> you know, the big oyster columns, you know, these big blocks that just sat there and barely smoldered. Um, and uh, we need to get it up to at least 160. I'd go to 180. Why do I, why, why I get the water so hot? It's because when you dump your media, your straw or your dried plant material, it takes some of that heat out. So I like to get it up a little bit hotter, and then I like to, to, like to lock it down. Um, submerge it for one to two hours. All right. So then all you have to do is take it out, remove it, and then you can put in more media while the water's still hot. Okay, you don't let it go to waste. So do a second dunk and pull it out. So you can do about two cycles of that water before it has to be discarded. The other method without heat. Oh, wow, two questions. Must have confused somebody. Uh, so for, for the two cycle next, the uh, water use, if you, if you use your um, mushroom cooking machine, yeah, that's that's one of the things we're doing is watering it into the compost or through our micro filters. Yeah, that's a big thing I, I try to get covered in the book is um, being responsible for your own waste. Even as a mushroom grower, you will have some byproducts. Um, some of the straw may have residual herbicides in it. Most of it does. Yeah. My kid so. So, yeah, you mentioned herbicides, and I guess I'm new to this, so I'm wondering for us, why, why do you need to pasteurize if the, the mushrooms are still so good at, um, you know, colonizing uh, molds and, and remediating? What are you pasteurizing from? This is because a mold is a fungus, so uh, the coffee grounds paper, that's very selective for just mycelium. But if you, if you just soak this material in hot water, it'll grow everything. Does that make sense? Um, only a few mushrooms can out compete the competitors, like the pink oyster mushroom. You have to really should and have to pasteurize it to level the playing field. Okay. Um, I'm just curious, like heating water then add the heat, and you have to maintain the heat so you're bringing it to temperature and you're saying this. I think I'll cover that in a second. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, you do have to maintain that temperature. You 
don't let it come down below 160. You'll get weed seeds and you'll get molds and things just show up. You need a nice heat in two hours. The other method is without heat at all, which is another method we were using in Haiti um, because of the lack of uh, availability for propane. So it's calcium hydroxide. So uh, I typically use uh, uh, one cup for every 10 gallons or however much if you need to make a pH of 9. Okay, That's your target is pH 9 which is pretty high. All right, Mycelium can tolerate that because in those enzymes that they exude, that sweat, those chemical keys, are, uh, they're actually acidifying their environment. So they bring the pH down as they go. All right? Trichoderma and molds have a very hard time growing above 9. So it buys the mycelium time, a lot of time. So it's a no heat method. You can soak it overnight. There's also another method uh, with uh, peroxide. I don't use this very often. I've done it um, for teacher's kits, for classrooms. Uh, most over-the-counter peroxide is 3%. You dilute it 10 to 1. And then you can make a 3 tenths percent. And then you soak that in a bucket. Okay? Soak that overnight. You drain it. Then you spawn it immediately with your, with your medium. So you've got three different options. Heat, and two no heat methods. Yes. What can you do with the spent water? Again, the spent water um, is, is one of the problems. We can water through our spent media, mm -hmm. um, water it into some uh, more alkaline loving plants. I actually use the water when I do this to water my morel beds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can do that too. Uh, I'm going to cover morel cultivation in the next class at the very end. But uh, morel is like a pH, mine in my area, like a pH of around 8. So at least I could use it. I could dilute a little bit of water in. Do you ever use cold pasteurization? Cold pasteurization? Yeah. Uh, I do not. It's something that Peter and Paul Stevens yeah. talk about. But I don't know if they've ever done it, but I've done it. It works really well. What you do is you take whatever your substrate is. And you submerge it for seven to ten days. And the theory is the aerobes eat the aerobes and then you take it out of space like hell for about an hour. But the aerobes will die and you have aspects and then you don't have to use it there. And it's more there. I grew in different kinds of food, I was from mushrooms, so it's a philosophy mushrooms on it without a problem. No problems at all. What you have to do, you know, <laughs> you have to have no problems at all. No, yeah. you have problem. okay. The first time I did it, I had problems because I didn't make my material small enough and I didn't make my ratio high enough for my ceiling to suffer. So what you're saying is, for those who here, and I have tried this, <coughs> I don't know what you're talking about for a minute. Um, cold pasteurization means dunking material in water, right, and it creates an anaerobic environment. Do that for how long do you do it for? I did it for cool. seven days. Seven days? Yeah. And on a small scale, yeah. I have actually done it in a Ziploc bag and left a little bit open to let the gap out gas and it worked perfectly. And when you pull it out of the water and you get any of that water in your hands, it's it, it doesn't days. come off for days. <laughs> it's a say goodbye. Whoever you're dating, say goodbye to them. Because it is uh, awful. It is nasty. Uh, I tried it. I didn't have very good luck, but I'll, I'll go back and revisit it. Okay. 
um, that I want you guys to experiment with. Um, I've had some decent luck with it. Um, and we, the next time I go to Haiti, we actually have the Mylar set up, this big parabolic thing. Um, when I got my new farm, there was a huge, one of those old satellite dishes. Remember those? <laughs> Massive metal one. And we're going to put a sun tracker on it and just put the Mylar all over it and put the media right, right in there. Just cook it with some compressed lenses and you know, just cook it. Um, rapid and clear and then uh, black and then clear on the outside. You could also put it in a trench. I have done this before, uh, digging a trench, lining it with the, the black, covering it with clear and leaving it in there. Um, you do get a little bit of contamination. You use a high spawn rate, you don't have a problem. Now, why the clear glass pick up something black? Can you go back? Um, you wrap it in black and that attracts the heat. The clear makes a, um, an airspace to build the heat inside. Right? And then that's where we're using the mylar angle on the north. See, we're up down uh, South Carolina on the north side, and it just angles right in and just cooks that out of it. It gets really hot. Um, now, low heat at 145, you have to do it for longer. It's not, so if you do at least six, six hours, if you can get seven hours, that's great. Dread? Yes, see, uh, uh, the trench method you're talking about, I know I'm maybe getting ahead of you, but uh, for mylar remediation firms, would that be uh, one of the better ways to do? Uh, pasteurize your like chips uh, and things. Yeah, a large, large amount of substrate. For like, say, if I want to make a, uh, a filter for runoff from a, a, a farm. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. All right. So once you fruit your mushrooms, and you know, we come a long way from that one little pellet, <laughs> right? Isn't that amazing, though? It really is. You can take that pellet and go that far. Um, this mycelium. These mushrooms are harvested. All right, we got the golden oysters. So um, I live in the southeast. Um, I'm in a semi-tropical environment, and I can grow a lot of the tropicals almost year-round um, in, in a cold frame. Do you make any more holes in your in your uh, buckets, or do you just let them fruit out the bottom holes? I do cut holes in the side. <coughs> yeah, uh, the razor knife. Uh, Potter plant. Yeah. Um, there's there's uh, nursery pots. I take a little razor knife like a carpet knife and make an X and then they push right through. Remember, I told you how far they, how hard they can push. Yeah. They'll push that plastic and then it'll just bend right back when you, when you harvest them. Yeah. And you don't want to make too many holes either because you can get over pinning. Yeah. And I'm not going to cover over pinning this whole weekend. But it's um, too much too much oxygen, too much stimuli creates too many babies and then they can all abort. So you got to be careful. You want to minimize how many holes or surface area you have. Because it's all a battery. If you divide the battery up into 100 or 200 different areas, they're, they're all they're not going to get very much at all. They have to divide and share all that, and it just doesn't work. Um, they're kind. Of, they will self prune themselves. They'll dry a lot of them out, but a lot of them fall off. Um, my old method of doing it. I don't do this anymore. It's in columns, all right? Just to show you the different things you can fill, fruit and fill. This is a chicken house, an old chicken house. So, talking, thinking about structures that you can use, this is uh, totally off the grid. This one, this is an old monastery in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, they asked me, they used to have chickens, and then he had shot an undercover video of their chicken farms, and they shut them down. Um, they said they were de beaking them, and these were monks. They didn't de beak the chickens, they didn't do anything wrong. Uh, so they they pretty much decided they wanted to grow mushrooms for the rest of their life, which is cool. Mm -hmm. So the only mushroom monastery in the world. <laughs> These are cool monks. Um, so we converted their chicken houses. They didn't have even need the fans. We just went right in there, cleaned and pressure washed them a little bit, and then we were growing oyster mushroom. And it, just a few weeks after they got rid of the chickens, it's really cool. Now they're supplying this huge market in Charleston. And they grow a lot of their own uh, product now. I got them into, I said, listen, you've got all this property. You've got 5,000 acres. Grow your own straw. Grow your own media. You know, have it right there on site. So this is the straw, brewing columns, and those are the babies. You see all the babies trapped underneath the plastic? The clear, they're photo uh, uh, sensitive. If you poke too many holes, then they're all going to try to get out, and then they're all, some of them will abort. 
right? So these are trapped. You just have to wave goodbye. Right? It's sad. I actually have pictures of these on my wall. It's that sad. they start to cluster, they'll start to enlarge. This is only one day apart. So if you've never grown oyster mushrooms, really rapid. Um, I'm talking about maybe room temperature days, much slower in cooler environments. What's interesting is the cooler the temperature, the darker the pigments. So um, I, we figured out this little um, equation in our, in our uh, growing room. I, I was growing pink oysters, and they're all coming out like almost like albinos. So I increased the light levels, and I dropped the temperature five degrees, and they all turn bright red. So if you're having an issue with pigments, um, that's why I was saying on stage is mushrooms are mushrooms photosynthetic, not in the classic sense. They don't use chlorophyll. They do synthesize from light. A lot of wonderful compounds. The darker the cuticle, the better. Um, the more compounds that they make, levels they make. See, look how big, look how dark my pinks are. They're almost red. They're not pink. I should sell them as red oysters. A new cultivar. And you grow these in the dark and they're, they're going to look white. And my gold, the same, same exact thing. These are full of carotenes, different compounds. Yeah. Does a little of sunlight affect the flavor? If it affects the color? I don't know. I've never tried that before. Does it affect the flavor? It'd be hard to test that. I, I can't say that the, the ones that I've, I've got one uh, marble tin right in front of a window and I use just sunlight as opposed to a fluorescent lighting or anything like that. And I can't say that I get a little, a little better taste from the sunlight than from fluorescent, but not really that much noticeable. Alright, so now you, now you have your buckets. This is us fruiting in a very primitive humidity tent, right? Um, right on the ground, dirt ground, just a little plastic sheet right on the ground. You don't need much. Do it. The right temperature, the right substrate, a little bit of that spawn you make, and you're growing mushrooms. All right, and this turned into a big microfiltration operation here. Uh, this is down at the monks too, where we are filtering water. Uh, this is inside one of the greenhouses, so we're able to set it up. Once you have the soil, then you can sprout seeds inside the soil. These are sunflower seeds. They're very high in protein, so they have a spin off. Right. They're delicious too. Um, stem propagation is another method. Okay, how can you? So we're getting past the mycelium. This is a different uh, method of uh, stem propagation. All, some mushrooms uh, are good at it. A lot of them. Uh, these are terrestrial wood chip decomposers. Does anybody know what this one is? Kingsleaf Yeah. If you've ever grown it before, it always makes these big cords on the bottom. That's iconic. Right. Another thing that these uh, mushrooms need are different, other different forms of light to fruit. So pure culture sometimes isn't the best. That's why stem culture works fairly well, is because these uh, fungi associate with specific bacteria. And by harvesting and transplanting the stem bases, you're transplanting the whole community. Right? You're not using a pure culture anymore. So that's the King Shafari. It's beautiful. I grow lots of these. And I grew, uh, the one King Shafari that I grew, um, has anybody ever found King Shafari in the wild? <laughs> in the wild. Do you find it in the wild that often? I have. Yeah, but it's, it's kind of an anomaly. It's better. That's why they're fruit in town, because of all the mulch. That's why we're going to bomb the city. Right? Um, Hey, Walt, you're talking about that strain. Any truth to the eating them multiple days in a row induces some GI problems? I've heard of that. Uh, I've heard of it, but I've never eaten that many before. Um, I don't think I want to experiment with it after reading it before either. Um, but, but a story on uh, resilience here, and this is in, my, in the book, that talks about this one King Stoferia strain that I do have. Um, I picked one. I finally found my first wild kingster fairy. I was so proud that I brought it to a mycological meeting. And I passed my basket around, and everybody got to see my kingster fairy. And I'm getting my slideshow, and 
My basket comes back, everyone leaves, and I look inside the basket, and someone took it. <laughs> and I was furious. I was freaking out. And uh, so I looked in there, and I mean, these are people I knew. And I thought I knew. <laughs> and I looked in the basket, and there was, uh, no, I haven't been quite open. Because I also found in November, which is kind of rare down there. So uh, I thought I had a cool season, things took area. But I looked at my basket, and there was a couple tiny pieces of wood chips in there. I mean, smaller than your fingernail, your pinky. And there was just a tiny, tiny piece of mycelium, like, I mean, like this much, attached to the wood chip. All right? And so I took that tiny little piece, and it was just like having an ember, and you're freezing to death. <laughs> You're that desperate. And I wrapped it in wet cardboard, you know, kissed it, and I put it in a Ziploc bag, and I stuck it in my refrigerator, and I forgot about it. And then I came back, I was looking through my lab fridge, and I see the bag, and I'm like, oh, let me look at it. There was, I opened it up, and there was mycelium threaded all through the cardboard. So I took my dental tool, put it on auger, and whoop, it went across the plate in a few days. Boom, right on the grain, right on the sawdust. And within a couple of weeks, I had millions of pounds you know, of this sawdust spawn everywhere, all, all over the southeast. So it was sweet revenge. <laughs> <laughs> Someone had one meal, one mushroom, and now I've got millions of them. And I wouldn't have tried that had they not stolen my mushrooms. Think about it. Desperation. I got a little creative or desperate. So you can do that with these mushrooms. Uh, Bluets and Kingster Feria. Those are the two that I like to play with. Um, they're easy to grow in cardboard and transfer to chips, wood chips, very easily. All right, so you can take little bits. This is actually spawn, but you can do the same thing with the mycelium. You cut the uh, stem base, break it up, the mycelium, and wrap it up in cardboard like a little burrito. All right. I coined the phrase blue burrito, right? I like it. Don't eat it. It does not taste like a blue it, right? Or a sushi roll. You roll it up like this, right? And then you can stick it in a bag. Then you just wait. That mycelium, look at that, boom, within a few days, it's penetrating and going all throughout the cardboard. Now you've made cardboard spawn, right? Look at that. You can see how it's kind of bluish. That's blue it's spawn. It's really pretty and sweet. Now you've got carpet spawn. You can roll out the carpet. You know, and just put chips on it. So how do you do that? You just make a layer. This is what I call the lasagna layer. All you need is some fresh wood chips and you need your cardboard. Alright? By the way, let me back up. Once you have a piece of cardboard like this, you can keep expanding it on that cardboard for a while. So I use it just like a layer. You unroll this, stick two fresh pieces of cardboard on the outside. So put this one as the middle layer, roll it back up. Let it sit for a week, unroll it, one, two, three, four, five. Right? And you keep doing that, and then you have a lot of cardboard spawn. Then you can take it outside and just bury it. Use it just like you would a spawn. Alright, so you have the cardboard, chips, your cardboard spawn, more chips. And they cover it with a little bit of uh, your native leaves and whatnot. Right? You got these beautiful purple mushrooms. The mycelium uh, will thread into the wood chips. And the reason I drew this is so you can see that the mycelium explores. It's looking for more food. Mushrooms only fruit when they think they're running out of food. So don't have any other wood chips nearby. You have to kind of make little islands, little satellites. So that shows you how far they can explore. Once they reach out and they determine that they, they're not going to find anything else, then they'll fruit. These are my Kingston area beds. You can see these are recycled engine crates from BMW. We have a BMW plant an hour away. They pay to get rid of these. So I just scoop them up and I fill them full of wood chips. They pay to get rid of them? They pay to get rid of them. Great. Yeah, they're huge. These are actually cut in half. They're this tall. Uh, this is Sancion, they mean they fruit on the outside of the beds. They're just looking for more food. They're also uh, uh, right at this north side, right on that interface. Yep. Do you soak the lasagna layers? Yes, like you do. Daily or 
Not at all. You um, soak them pretty heavily the first week, and then the way that those cardboard layers act, it actually locks in all the moisture. So it works really, really good. I rarely have to water my things very good at all. Just do it in a shady spot near a drip line of a tree. Do you, right? do you soak your witches to uh, make better so you put them in your dry? Uh, no. I, well, if the chips are extremely fresh, if they're chipped right then, I don't soak them. But if they're dry, definitely soak your chips. Watering your chips, too, also helps the mycelium, you know, leap off and stick to it if you're using real spawn. If you do dry chips, it just kind of wiggles down to the bottom. All right. So look at my Kingston area. They're, these are small, actually, average size. They can get up to two feet across. I figured out that for every inch of chip depth, gives you an inch of that cap diameter. So if your chips are two feet deep, guess how big your strip areas are going to be? Two feet wide. Garden schools. So one of the other things you can do um, is with some of that cardboard spawn is you can use uh, you could use stem bases of other mushrooms, such as uh, uh, I'll show you in a minute. But uh, the traditional method of inoculating logs. All right, with a drill, with plug spawn, spawn that you purchase, and we're doing that at 11 o'clock. Um, this is a different different method. You can actually use some of your cardboard that you cloned your mushrooms with, and you can push it into the hole just as you would use spawn. So it's cardboard spawn. Right. Uh, well, is there anybody in the southeast that's growing uh, commercially? Um, not yet. That would be me. Sure, I I grow inside very well. Um, little sawdust pellets. Remember I said the uh, uh, peroxide method. It's good to soak uh, sawdust and peroxide if you want to expand your spawn. Even if you buy some spawn, you can expand it, and then you can use that right inside the holes instead of uh, plug spawn. You can use those uh, coffee cultures. If you're growing oyster mushrooms or other strains, you don't even have to uh, drill or plug. I just put the spawn right in between the layers of logs, just like icing on a cake, and just sandwich them. Within a day or two, the mycelium drills its way up into those uh, wood bases. You don't need to wax or do anything. Uh, chainsaw cuts like this are very easy. They're also uh, perfect for inserting black sheets of <laughs> they fit perfectly in there. Right. Do, do you wax over those? Uh, I don't use wax anymore at all. Uh, I figured out if I stack if I stack these like firewood and I keep them water for uh, one day, the mycelium is in the wood in one day. So I'm not saying everybody forget wax, but I'm forgetting wax. <laughs> it's a whole step. And then, you know, find, locate some shade north side of your house, near a downspout, uh, shady woods environment. For fruiting, you've got shiitakes, you've got maitake. These are mostly wood decomposers that you can grow on cardboard. You can expand it and put it back in logs and wood. Uh, chicken in the woods, has anybody ever eaten that? It grows here, right? It's all over my uh, town right now, it's everywhere. Uh, I can collect tons of it. It's just a mad flush of it. Different strains grow on different types of wood. That's me. They're not small mushrooms when you find them. I mean, they're awesome. These regenerate, so when you cut them, they regenerate a whole new little strip, like a little tender line. So don't pull the whole mushroom off. If it's, the base of these are really woody and not good to eat anyway. So if you trim them, a nice soft tip will form again. It'll regenerate. Can you? Propagate those from the wood part, like you use stem propagation? Yeah, they're actually really easy. Chicken in the woods is a powdery mycelium. And it smells like hell. It smells like a sulfur bomb. So be ready for that. Uh, lion's mane is another one. Excellent edible. And of course the anokis. We've got plenty of anokis around here for you to experiment with. Uh, if the bases of these mushrooms now do not propagate very well, uh, what you're going to do is take a knife and go into this, the actual wood and nick out some of those that colonized wood. That's what you're going to wrap up in the cardboard. Make sense? These are very rubbery mushrooms. They don't 
assimilate very well back into mycelium. So I go right inside with a knife and get some little pieces of wood chunks. Sometimes I'll soak those wood chunks in a little bit of peroxide, then I'll put them right on to the cardboard, and it works great. That's how I clone things now, very easily. Uh, I had a lot of problems cloning mushrooms that were really hard to grow. Right. Now this is not what I was doing last night. Okay. This looks suspicious. Um, you can take spore prints. There are some ways to use spores. Uh, and John Holliday spoke about this, about making spore oil. Uh, but it's fairly easy to make. Uh, harvesting them, putting mushrooms uh, face down on glass or on a mirror. You scrape them up. They're adhesive when they're fresh, so let them dry. And they'll separate easier. So let them dry, and then you scrape them up and make a powder, right? Then you can put that powder in your uh, uh, vegetable oil or canola oil. It doesn't have as high of a viscosity as um, a hydrocarbon based oil. So if you're a casual, every, not an everyday chainsaw user, this works fine. Uh, put the spores in the oil, and then the, the, uh, the, the stump bases become inoculated with the oil, and so does his genes. <laughs> yeah. Maybe this guy would be growing mushrooms on his genes. Oh, he's, he's using the spore oil as a chain loop? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, and there is, we, we have a uh, sawmill near our house. That's where we get all of our uh, uh, substrate from. And, um, He's allowing us to experiment with his uh, log cutting machinery to actually score as he cuts his big uh, log lane clearing machinery, which is really cool. So we're outfitting his uh, log, log logging machines with sport solutions. <laughs> so, so that's what's happening. You know, we've got to make soil again. Uh, growing mushrooms is a really easy way to make soil. Another method. Uh, this is very easy to grow corn smut. And I know John didn't talk about this. When he, I actually threw this in there when I saw him talking about it. Remember that last night? Uh, we, we've been doing this a long time. And uh, somebody sent me a paper on how to do it. You find corn smut. Uh, and, and I actually found one. It was a dried up kernel that had been in storage at Clemson University for over 20 years. And I found it on the floor. And I knew exactly what it was. It was a black kernel of corn. So I took it and I um, crushed it up and I put it inside a syringe and I got corn smut in a couple weeks from a kernel that had been there 20 years sitting there. And now I have plenty of inoculums, right? Uh, and go right down the silk channel. As soon as the silk comes out, you shoot it down there and you're in business. That corn smut just comes right out. So you have to be corn smut on actual corn plants. You can't just do it on parts of corn. No, it's got to be, because it has to go down the pollen, right? Really? Um, you have to do it this way. Have you heard anyone taking the hand products of corn smudge and like just go in lab markets and try and, you know, I think it would be vile if you just kill them. Yeah, they sterilize the module. Yeah, and these are really good to eat, actually. Uh, we're actually experimenting with this one for biofuel because it's a, a, it behaves like a yeast inside the corn. Uh, other methods, if you do the sawdust to the peroxide method, if you uh, peroxide sawdust that's been supplemented, you can add a shiitake culture to it and make your own little blocks. All right. uh, it's a little bit more difficult than the oyster mushrooms. Shiitakes are very slow growing fungus compared to oysters. They're weak. They're very weak. Um, and then I like to grow brick tops, which are hypoalamids um, at my farm. So I've grown all these from clones that I've cultivated on cardboard. Right. Very easy to do. And then lion's veins, of course. So look at that metabolite building up inside the bag. Beautiful yellow fluid. If you take the lion's vein inside and turn a black light on, the mycelium turns orange. It's really interesting. I have no idea why. I haven't been able to figure it out. Did you find that out accidentally? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have black lights in my lab now just for that reason. <laughs> And all those things sound weird. She goes, I see them there with like the lights off and the black lights. She goes, What are you doing to those mushrooms? <laughs> <laughs> She's getting jealous. <laughs> I'm just talking to them, maybe. <laughs> Herding structures. Again, you can get off the grid with this. Our lab, by the way, is all LED lighting. The whole farm now is uh, all LEDs. Period. Uh, it was expensive.
expensive to get that done, but we've got the solar panels already, so we're going to have everything hooked up. Right? Uh, simple structures like this can be buried. You can dump, uh, get them half underground, use the, the dirt that you've dug out and mound them over, make little hobbit houses out of them. All right? Perfect environments for growing mushrooms. Uh, fruiting structures, bigger not better. Um, smaller rooms, larger rooms are more difficult to prevent cross-contamination. So just some considerations. I mean, I've, I've developed a, a little closet system. You can grow 10 pounds of mushrooms in a 4x4 four four area using your coffee cultivation and the whole thing. If you make one of those buckets a week, you'd be growing 9 to 10 pounds of mushrooms a week for your family, right, on waste. If you have to have a tunnel on your property, right? Some lady actually says, I do. <laughs> I said, really? She goes, yeah, I do. Uh, she goes, I have a tunnel. All right, uh, great areas, you can block one of these off uh, and, and use it as a breeding room. Also, which is cool, if you've never seen this, the, the some of the old transit routes in Australia are using some of the old underground trains really long because they're they're moist and humid in there, they're cool year round, and they're growing a lot of mushrooms in these now. And they started doing this in England as well. Caves, bunkers, tunnels, um, missile silos. <laughs> now we're really gonna go off the grid. Okay? This is my this is my second lap here. And then Olga's going to get some breakfast. Um, when you talk, when you think about circular systems and perpetual systems, you, can't, you try to minimize the amount of inputs and outputs. So I try to think of my farm, especially my growing room and my business, as uh, if you want to be sustainable, um, if you want to do good things for the planet, you really, really can't have any waste. You've got to be a zero waste facility. You've got to do it. Um, one of the things that we're also working on, too, is uh, cultivating morels. And I've done a lot of uh, cultivation of morels outdoors. We've still got a little bit of a ways to go indoors. The, the wood chip morel? Wood chip morels? Uh, the um, landscape morel? Yeah. Marcello, Rupa, Bernia, and uh, Marcello. Yeah, we don't have those on that side. So um, I've been growing the little tulip deliciosa types. But um, I like the fact that we can plant morels now and it's with a fair amount of success for me in the southeast using the technique. But um, I really want to grow false morels because they make uh, they can synthesize hydrazines, which is basically a component of rocket fuel. So that's one of the things we're going to try to do is grow the false morels, for not only for protein but also for the end product of getting monomethyl hydrazine. Right? Um, People who go to space and go to Mars are going to need food. They're going to need fuel. Right? Imagine growing false morels on Mars. Good luck. Right? Poisonous in its raw state. Um, even some of its relatives, uh, Michael Bug said that uh, morels are highly toxic and raw. That's why she cook them. Right? There's more poisonings when people eat morels than any poisonings for these. Yeah. So that's the false morale tool. Um, again, what about substrates? Right? Access to substrates. You got these floating aquatic plants. Perfect, beautiful. They're free. Drag them out of the ocean, drag them out of the river. Right? And use them as a substrate. It's all around us. Um, also in our growing rooms, what we're doing is we're uh, We've got a friend of mine, an algae expert. Actually, he's a biofuel expert. Vermont University. So instead of introducing a lot of fresh air into our growing rooms, we are going to percolate the heavy CO2 water into his algae tanks, right? To scrub the CO2 out of our building. Then what happens to all the algae? It's turned into biodiesel. Some of these are up to 60% oil. Right, so we can press them and we can put them in our delivery trucks to go <coughs> out to deliver. It's growing out the bubbling CO2. Right now they have to inject, they have to burn fossil fuel to do the research. 
to bubble CO2 gas to make it high enough to grow algae, to grow fuel, they're burning fuel, right? And they percolate CO2 from a mushroom farm that's free. And they're making oxygen in some sense. Right? Anyway, I got a lot of information in the book. Uh, Diva has it at the home theater. Okay. And that's it. That's it for now. Hey. There's a lot of videos on this website, a lot of interpretive stuff, so um, it's an extension of everything we do. I've got another talk coming up at 11, that'll be um, lab skills.